Good afternoon, KubeCon, and welcome to Operator Day. We've got an action-packed day for you here. Every year, we run a Kubernetes and Cloud Native survey and report to share information about the Cloud Native landscape and the people who work within it. In each of the last two reports, we've learned that 30% of respondents are interested in learning more about operators, and the audience today is an example of that. We're looking forward to exploring Kubernetes, the creation of charmed operators, diving into the roadmap for Juju, adding observability and testing frameworks with ease, and much, much more. As well as finishing the day off with a panel discussion, including representatives from the CNCF, ISVs, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. And now, I'm pleased to get this day started by introducing Mark Shuttleworth, the CEO of Canonical. Thank Mark, you. welcome to Operator Day. Hi, thank you. It's great to be uh, joining you. Mark, I'm going to jump right in here. Ubuntu 2204 LTS released last month, and you were quoted as saying that our mission is to be a secure, reliable, and consistent open source platform everywhere. Ubuntu has long been a supporting piece in the cloud native stacks around the world. What are some of the things that KubeCon attendees might already know, but bears repeating about Ubuntu? Uh, well, in the, in the Kubernetes context, um, Ubuntu is by far the most widely used um, operating system in the cloud native space in general. I think there was a CNCF study recently showed Ubuntu is number one, more than 60% share, so more than everybody else um, put together. Um, and the reason for that, I guess, is number one, our focus on the developer experience and developer ecosystem for building containers. So if you are you know, just wanting to create a container or reuse a container or build on a container, Ubuntu tends to be um, a sort of a common currency. I think the second thing that really drives that is that we recognized early that, in fact, the best Kubernetes is almost certainly the one that comes with your infrastructure. So if you've chosen Azure, then that would be AKS. If you've chosen Google, that would be GKE and um, VMware, Tanzu, and so on. And so we focus very, very much on, on working with those teams, the teams behind those kind of embedded Kubernetes in the infrastructure, to make sure that um, they didn't have to worry too much about the operating system. And more importantly, their users can have a, a, um, something that feels native to that environment because they're doing it, but also feels consistent with the experiences people will have elsewhere. So you can, you can, you can choose AKS on Azure and GKE on Google. And to the extent that you want to get under the hood, you're going to have a consistent Ubuntu experience. Um, and that seems to be working really well. We continue to kind of grow, um, partnerships to focus on optimizing those Kubernetes uh, experiences in each of those infrastructure environments. Um, we do have our own two Kubernetes distributions. We've got Charmed Kubernetes. That's really focused in places where the underlying infrastructure can't do the work for you. So bare metal is a really good example. If you, if you need to build a big bare metal Kubernetes cluster, then Charmed Kubernetes is very interesting. It will it will give you a sophisticated level of, uh, of sophisticated control of the architecture while at the same time giving you this kind of reusable model driven operations experience. That's really, that's really elegant. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, if you think about a developer laptop or Raspberry Pi or um, a small cluster of three servers at the edge, Microcates is really designed to be a kind of zero ops thing in a, again, in a, in the place where infrastructure can't do that for you for whatever reason. Um, and so that's very, very popular um, with both developers and people deploying to the edge. It's kind of a, a zero ops Kubernetes effectively. And actually that's coming along in terms of its ability to scale and cluster. So um, we continue to kind of reduce the memory footprint and, um, and improve the kind of seamless automation of the zero ops up to pretty material scale. You can run pretty large clusters with microcates and not really worry about anything else. We'll touch base on that a little bit more as we get into this conversation, but Jammy Jellyfish, what's new in the 2204 release? Well, it's a whole new name. I mean, Jammy Jellyfish, we haven't used that one before. So that was, um, that, that was, a, that was a favorite. Um, in the release itself, uh, the stuff that stands out for me, confidential computing on the cloud. So really getting to um, a place where, you know, and, and the, the one that we can really focus on in, in the, the last couple of months and is really blazing the trail is Azure. Um, and that is all about 
you know, being able to put VMs on the cloud with a very high degree of certainty that even the cloud themselves can't introspect into those VMs. Um, and that depends on, on some, some pretty sophisticated layers that are new to the, both the, 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 the cloud genre and to all of the kinds of hardware involved and to the clouds themselves. So it's, it's still fairly early days, but I really, I think it's very impressive what Azure have done there. Um, you, you, you really can imagine now moving workloads to the cloud and treating that as, as confidential infrastructure, even though it's, it's somebody else's data center famously, right? Um, so that's very exciting. And, uh, you know, we'll, Azure's blazing that trail, but it's very much a theme in the industry. And there's a lot of work behind the scenes to, to bring that to fruition on, on, um, on all the public clouds. And it's fair to say. Um, similarly, ARM, um, ARM servers, uh, Amazon blazed that trail. Oracle is now really out there talking about um, ARM servers. Azure um, has also announced an ARM server capability. It's really fun to be, you know, right at the front of that as, as the operating system. We, we originally did ARM because we wanted to do a mobile phone. And that work is, you know, has, has built a developer ecosystem. It got us to port essentially the entire operating system. That same port is now, you know, front and center on these on these ARM physical servers and ARM virtual servers on the cloud. So that's exciting. Um, coming, coming back to the developer theme, uh, it, you know, if you think about the Windows developer or the Mac OS developer, um, it's, it's important to us to kind of bring them into the fold because while they may be using, you know, those other platforms from a daily driver perspective, their workloads are going to go onto the cloud or their workloads are going to go onto IoT and that might be, that might be Ubuntu, right? That might be Linux. So you've got WSL in the Windows case, which is super interesting. Lots of work on WSL in 2204. Uh, it's a really nice upgrade for people who have been running WSL. Um, uh, again, Ubuntu is like, the vast majority of the Linux WSL stuff that's going on. And it's fun to work with the Microsoft crowd on that. Um, Multipass steps back a little bit from the sort of deep integration with Windows that WSL can achieve, but it gives you a consistent sort of VM on demand, Ubuntu VM on demand um, that supports full cloud in it. So it's like a cloud VM. Um, and that's on Windows and Mac OS exactly the same. It allows you to kind of do your cloud prototyping for free on your workstation and then push those images out to um, um, all those scripts and whatever to the, to the clouds. Um, lots of new stuff at the level of applications, a lot of open source work on open source SQL and proprietary SQL, um, um, SQL Server from Microsoft on Ubuntu, Postgres, Maria, MySQL, um, Redis, uh, Kafka, and, and a bunch of other kind of data oriented things happening in 2204. And we're expressing that stuff both as kind of raw materials packages and, and so on, but also Docker images. So um, Docker images that people can obviously pop onto their Kubernetes. So the idea is that there's an increasing portfolio of things that you can get with a 10 year security maintenance commitment. So it's a standard image you can just integrate into your workflows and you don't have to reinvent the wheel for something that is effectively standard for everybody. That's fantastic. It sounds like the, um, the, the open source applications portfolio is really expanding here. Yes, I mean, I think I think the Linux the Linux game is well understood. Um, the something seventy percent of, of Linux developers prefer Ubuntu, so um, we continue to invest there. But um, we, we're sort of looking at the complexity further up the stack and, and the problems that people have, essentially. Um, uh, operationalizing things that are standardized applications. Every every bank is running all of those databases. Every telco is running all of those message queues. Every you know media company is running all of those kinds of content services and transcoding capabilities and so on. So why why have everybody reinvent the wheel, build their own Docker images and their own op automation operationalization and so on? Why not why not just standardize that and share that and have one set of bugs and one set of fixes that 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 seems like a very compelling idea. So it certainly seems to resonate well with people when, when, when they realize that that's, that's a possibility. If we could, I'd like to change pace a little bit here before we get into to, to 124 um, and then the highlights around that. Um, last month, you spoke with TechCrunch about Canonical's plans for IPO. Would you like to share a little about that and with the audience at KubeCon? Um, sure, not too much to say. Uh, we're planning to float next year. Very clear path to that flotation. Um, active work, both in the sort of capital market um, arena, 
um, not in terms of raising, um, but just in terms of getting the right advice for the procedural steps to, to, to become a public company. Um, uh, hiring at the board level and then more generally hiring across the board. Um, as, you know, there's, there's a, the reason to do it is to raise our game, um, uh, operate in a way that many of our customers have to operate, kind of live that, breathe that, um, uh, empathize with that. Uh, so that's, that's a lot of work, um, but it feels like the right course. And we're very committed to that. It'll happen at a very high level of confidence next year. Canonical's hiring a lot right now, and there's a lot of jobs available. If you're interested in roles at Canonical, you can check out the link that, that we'll be sharing here um, in, in the comment section. Um, we were going to move on to talk about what's new with uh, 124. Um, so 124, um, a, a exciting release on, on our side, and it's microcates and charm Kubernetes. Uh, on the microcates front, uh, as part of this kind of um, desire to make the zero ops Kubernetes cluster experience out of microcates, um, building a distributed storage capability of OpenEBS, Maya store on microcates 124 gives you high availability of distributed storage with a single command to install single command cluster, right? It's just the thing of beauty. <laughs> Team's really proud of that. Um, and then making a framework for add-ons. You know, we, we, we've got a very vibrant community of people adding add-ons all the time to microcates to kind of give themselves you know, one-click access to stuff that they, that they, that they want for repeatedly in, in, in any way they, they might be running microcates. Now making that into a bit of a framework so that developers can, can um, kind of accelerate that process. That's very nice on the, on the microcates 124 front. In the charm cates um, world, there's been a bunch of work to integrate with auto scaling capabilities. So you get a cluster auto scaler um, charm effectively. It's a standard supported capability now. Really shows the benefit of the Juju charmed, charmed operator approach. Um, and then uh, we also use charms, the kind of operations packages. It's kind of a level up from operators. And we use those for some services that we drop onto Kubernetes. So there's a new traffic um charm so that again starts to really enhance the experience that people have living with kubernetes after they after they've got it up um they they have to live with it and sometimes you know for extended periods of time um bringing a model driven approach to that operational reality is uh, is, cool, is is very nice um and then just generally across the board yeah dgx ready so both microcates and charm kubernetes are nvidia dgx ready just an unbelievable platform the dgx um Data science, you, you know, at a you know at a at a level of of performance that is, I think, impossible to achieve any other way. And so, you know, at small scale, microcates will will nail that for you if you've just got a couple of DGXs. That's a big investment, a couple of DGXs. But if you're going all out for a supercomputer that way, then Charmed, uh, Charmed Kubernetes will give you kind of uh, bare metal Kubernetes on DGXs at scale with a bunch of sophistication as to what you can mix into the to the architecture that you're building there. So that's a lot of fun. And then just from upstream 124, um, CSI volume health, uh, really um, appreciated getting rid of Docker shim, network policy status, um, storage capacity tracking. So all the sorts of things that are biting people who, who have clusters and, and are living with them, um, getting, getting addressed there. Mark, as a final wrap up here, um... What do you see happening in the Kubernetes space going forward as we move into 2022 and beyond? Well, Kubernetes is a bit like uh, a bit like Libc, Systemd. You, you know what I mean? Very, very um, uh, traumatic and disruptive for some uh, for a while, and then just kind of happens, right? Fades into the background. I think that's how it should be, right? So this whole idea of push button cates, uh, push button cates from your infrastructure, I think is really coming to focus. Um, so we continue to, to work with the infra providers on those um, with Canonical Ubuntu as kind of the unifying layer, layer across the multi-cloud environment and then microcates, uh, microcates Trump Kubernetes for kind of bare metal scenarios or niche scenarios or embedded scenarios. Like if you're an ISV and you, and you want to bring your own Kubernetes to all those different environments and, and not have the sort of two-layer operations regime, then microcates, of course, embeds really beautifully. Um, the next hard problem is the application story. Um, GitOps is fine, but you are literally rolling your own everything, and that's tiresome. 
So um, the question is what we can do about standardized apps. We're very excited about the charmed operator approach. You know, it's kind of all the benefits of operators plus plus. Um, lots of people um, complaining about problems with, you know, living with operators that charmed operators solve directly. Um, so if people haven't tried them, I really recommend they go pick a use case, Kubeflow or something else. And we'll be getting into that a lot today and then really guiding people through that. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and building an ecosystem around that, building communities so that, so that effectively you really can share the load. Um, I think that's super important. Um, uh, making all of this easier for people so that their precious skills can be focused on things that are differentiating. This is the big theme. Um, um, trying to provide a higher level of abstraction for those applications so that people really don't have to know about the details. Uh, but can still kind of be optimal on, you know, their cloud of choice, their substrate of choice. Um, this, this notion of kind of model-driven operators, charmed operators, is taking that pattern up a level, right? So the, with the operator pattern, you know, take it up a level and say, look, I, I want to be able to have a unified view of operators from a bunch of different manufacturers, vendors, and I want to be able to get that same view anywhere, right? Different, different um, infrastructure environments, perhaps even beyond Kubernetes, right? So that I, I can start to unify the way I think about software at scale, integrated and, and operated, um, Kubernetes or not. Um, so really that sort of summarizes things, push button cakes everywhere, uh, push button standardized applications that are, that are really easy to operate and integrate, um, multi-cloud, charmed operators, um, that, that kind of unify both the deployment and the sort of day two, day 200, day 2000 sort of experience. Um, that's, that's where I think things are going. Mark, we are flying through a lot of stuff right now. I appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We'll, we'll see you later in the day for the panel discussion with experts from, uh, from Google, AWS, Microsoft, Edward Jones, Weaveworks. Uh, we've got a good panel there. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And um, before we move to that panel discussion, we've got a lot of great stuff coming your way. Um, over 30% of respondents to the second Kubernetes and cloud native operations survey said that they are interested in learning more about operators. And that's a big part of what today's about. So stay tuned to explore operator usage for standing up applications, um, learning more about automating your day two operations, adding observability with just a few clicks, implementing a testing framework, learning about building a sophisticated product using charmed operators, in this case in the ML space, looking at Kubeflow. And next, I'm happy to introduce Alex Jones, the engineering director for Kubernetes at Canonical and a tech lead for the technical advisory group on app delivery at the CNCF. As we wait for Alex to get set up, here's your moment of zen. <laughs>